In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, uh, everyone, to our Sunday Gospel Reflection here for the 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Um, and uh, we're going to jump right into our text. We want to get out our Bibles. Father Sebastian, you got a Bible in front of you? Bingo. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, just a little reminder to everybody participating. You know, our goal is here through our Sunday Gospel Reflection. I was talking with somebody who says, you know, you really should do this in like five minutes or three minutes. You know what? You got a lot of great commentaries out there on the internet. 30 seconds on the coming gospel, okay? I just saw one of these things. To be honest with you, I don't know. It might be helpful to some people, but it's a little bit of a disservice to the text because we really want to jump in and do a Bible study. At the Institute of Catholic Culture, we're about real education. We're diving in deep. So make the time in your day um, each week to sit down with your Bible, open up this study, and we're just going to walk through it. And hopefully, I hope, that these will give you the tools necessary to be able to really appreciate the biblical text on Sunday when you go uh, to Mass. So our, our, first, our first text are, is an Old Testament reading from the prophet Amos, Amos, which is one of those uh, prophets you probably, let me just take a guess. It's been maybe at least five days since you opened up Amos and started reading. <laughs> and, uh, so, but look at this, guys. Amos is a grand total of nine chapters, okay? In my Bible, it's like three pages or four pages. Come on. Get out your Bibles, open up Amos, and you're going to read the context of Amos, okay? Turn off CNN and uh, throw the New York Times in the trash, or rather burn it. It's always a good thing to burn it because it kind of gets the fire going. Yeah, so... <laughs> We're going to get rid of all the nonsense in our life and jump right in here to the Old Testament text. Amos chapter 7, Amos chapter 7, verse 12. Amos chapter 7, verse 12. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, said to Amos, Off with you, visionary. Flee to the land of Judah. There earn your bread by prophesying, but never again prophesy in Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. But Amos answered Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor have I belonged to a company of prophets. I was a shepherd and a dresser of sycamores. The Lord took me from, the follow, from following the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. You know, this is a great text because it does what we oftentimes do in our lectionary, and we just kind of like parachute in, and we don't know where we're standing, why we're saying what we're saying, and we just want to rubber stamp our fulfillment and get mass over with. Well, we can't approach it like that. There is a beautiful mystery which the church is uh, asking us to enter into, similar to what we've been, uh, we've been talking about uh, over these past weeks in this post-Pentecost season. I keep saying that. I'm not going to stop saying it because it's very important that when we're hearing the, the, the scriptures proclaimed in the church, the church is placing certain scriptures there to guide our spiritual life. So this is, this is uh, 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 liturgical catechesis or liturgical spirituality. Okay, Liturgical spirituality is the foundational spirituality. It begins on the day of our baptism and continues the rest of our life to the extent that we actually enter into it. This is a challenge now. Amos. First of all, who was Amos? When was he, uh, when was he prophesying? When was he writing? Who's Amaziah? Where's Bethel? You've got to answer all these questions. Who, what, why, where, and when? And that's why we have Father Sebastian with us. <laughs> we have Father Sebastian because the guy knows his stuff. Not only that, because he's my brother. And uh, so, uh, Father, please help us unpack this, this thing. Give us the, first of all, let's just walk through it. Uh, where's Bethel? Because so, the whole, there's, there's a difference, right? Israel, Bethel, the Holy Land, where, where's he at? Well, it's helpful, as you mentioned, I think in a, a few of the uh, reflections back, we were reading one of the prophets, and you pointed the audience to a very important aspect of all the prophets, and that is, Always read the first paragraph of a prophet because the form of the text as we have it, say Isaiah or Amos, these are a series of prophecies that these individuals gave, sometimes over a few years, sometimes over a lifetime like Isaiah. 
And then they were collected. These scrolls were collected and put into one text, one manuscript. But the editor who puts those all together, com the compiler, possibly Ezra, someone suggested, puts in the beginning of the book, Isaiah or Amos, a little historical information. Now, that is part of the inspired text, which means that is God's will. Not only the, the individual who put the book together as it is, but that's God's will for us to make sure we begin reading Amos or Isaiah with the historical context, as the church always reminds us. So if we look at Amos, it says in chapter 1, the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa. So Tekoa is a uh, is down in the south, near the Negev area. So this is a place where they shepherded their sheep. He was a shepherd, a poor man. Shepherds didn't have a lot of money. And there were lots of shepherds out there trying to make a buck by selling their sheep. So he, he's a poor shepherd living a, nomad, a semi-nomadic life, maybe, down there in the, the southern area, the Negev, the very arid, dry region. It's not a desert like the, you know, the Sahara Desert, but it's, it's like the Mojave Desert. There's, there's rocks and a few trees and things, but it, it's very hot and dry. And so he's from down in that region. He's a shepherd. And it says, these are the visions which he saw concerning Israel, that's the northern kingdom, in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So we're told he's a prophet to the north, that is the northern kingdom called Israel. Our audience, I'm sure, remembers from many of the different lectures from the Institute that the people of Israel in the Old Testament, the kingdom, divided after Solomon. And there were two, two countries or nations. You had the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. Initially, the prophets are sent first to the northern kingdom because they are the ones that were in the most sin and the most danger, therefore, of a coming massive chastisement. As a result, it came the Assyrian uh, exile. So here's that historical information. And look at, I love that line in verse one, two years before the earthquake. So this author who has put this text together for us, Ezra or whoever, and again, the divine author is concerned that we read this in a, in a historical setting and look at the look at the immediacy there two years before the earthquake now i don't know what earthquake it is commentators don't know it's so far away they had earthquakes but his audience his original audience knew that earthquake and could knew could how to pinpoint the exact moment when he was doing these things you know I encourage our, our participants go back and read first kings chapter 11 um, and chapter 12 to get that kind of historical context of what was going on during this time of Jeroboam and, and really the following, of course, the following uh, time, but be, this split between these northern ten tribes, which become known as Israel, and then, uh, and then the, and in, this, in the south is left basically Judah, um, which has, which has subsumed Benjamin at that point. So basically Judah's left by itself and the Northern 10 tribes break off from the, uh, the throne in Jerusalem and, uh, not a good idea. So there's basically a civil war, a, a, a schism in the, in the kingdom. Uh, so important. Remember that in the context, because as, as we, I always find myself, I go back to chapter one, verse one of the prophet. But, um, but then I can't stop reading. And look at this, Father, as you mentioned that, I, was just, I just kept reading just another verse in verse 2. Let's look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. He said, The Lord roars from Sion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Okay, so he's saying, the, the prophet is saying to those in the north that have broken off from the kingdom, the Lord's speaking from Jerusalem. He's roaring from Jerusalem. Okay, but now look at this. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Well, where's Carmel? It's in the north. And, uh, and so it's the highest mountain. If I'm not mistaken, Carmel is the highest mountain in the Holy Land, but it withers. And uh, so, so important now to be able to read that in its proper kind. If you know geography, you know the history, now you're not going to just parachute in on Sunday. You're going to allow... Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the prophet to speak to you. And I would say, if you've been with us on one of those wonderful ICC pilgrimages, you've stood with us on Mount Tabor and looked 
at Mount Carmel right from there, uh, which really gives you that geography. So hopefully the next ICC trip, if you didn't go last time, go with us next time. There's a shameless plug for our pilgrimages. Yes, we're <laughs> going back. Okay, who's Amaziah? All right, Amaziah is a priest in the north. <coughs> he's in Bethel. Why is he in Bethel? Well, because he's not one of the Levitical priests. And here's the context, what's going on. Amos is down in the south, way down in the Negev down there. And God calls him a shepherd, like God called Moses to be a prophet. And he says, go to the north, go to the people in the north, and tell them what's going on what, and why they're in sin, about to receive a major chastisement. So he heads up north, and he comes to Bethel. Bethel and Dan, there were two places where the northern kingdom, when they split from the south— which you had our, uh, you've heard our audience to that, that text. When they split from the south, if our audience goes and reads, as you were suggesting there, they'll see that in chapter 12 of 1 Kings, that Jeroboam in the north, this is Jeroboam the first, who caused that split, realized that the people are going to head down south in their yearly pilgrimages three times out of the year. Three times out of the year, they're supposed to go there, Exodus chapter 23. So, he says, they're going to go down there. They're going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to see the king, the rightful king. And they're going to worship Yahweh down there, and they're going to come back here and kill me. So I've got to have an alternative religion. We've got an alternative kingdom. Now we have to have an alternative religion. And so he says to the people, look, I'll make you two golden calves. Remember the old days, boys? So he makes them a golden calf in, and puts it in Dan, which is the most northern part of his kingdom. And he puts another golden calf in Bethel, which is the most southern part of his kingdom, just before the border to the south. And so he says, go there now. No longer go to Jerusalem. Go worship the gods of Egypt. And these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. We have an echo, of course, from mm -hmm. Exodus 32. And so the people began to go worship not only the pagan gods of the land, but they continue in the Apis cult. Jeroboam was half Egyptian, and so he... Uh, had a tendency toward that Apis cult and he brought it for the people. So this is where we come into the story here. Amos has come to Bethel and he's confronting a pagan priest who is leading the people of Israel in sin of worshiping pagan gods. And he's in this pagan temple there. And this is where he comes and tells him you're in big trouble. And this is then when Amaziah responds to him and says, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? All right, so so uh, with that context, then there, we have one more line I think that's important to consider here. Uh, he says, "I was a shepherd and a dresser of sycamores. Um, the Lord took me from the following the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to the people of Israel.' Why help us understand these sycamores? Uh, what does it mean to be a dresser of sycamores?" So as he says, he he says, "I'm not a paid prophet. I'm not. It, it, we as we read the books of Kings, as you." Uh, suggest for the audience, we'll hear in there that there are the prophets called by God, often just an ordinary man, a shepherd, a fisherman, things like that. But then there are the paid prophets. These are the court prophets. We remember when Moses went to Pharaoh, there were the there were the magicians there. These are the court prophets. These guys are paid, and they're wise men. They maybe can do some trick with some smoke and mirrors, and they say what the king wants to say. And he and so Amaziah accuses Amos of being a court prophet from the South. He says, go earn your bread down in the South. And he says, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm not a court prophet. God called me. I'm a shepherd. And I sent me to come tell you this. This is really important. You better pay attention. He says, I was just an ordinary guy, a shepherd. And again, to show who he is, his poverty, he says, I was a dresser of sycamore trees. Now, in America, we think of sycamores, those huge, you know, mottled bark trees that grow down by the river. One of the biggest trees in America. But this is not what we're talking about. This is a sycamore fig. And you and I have seen many of these. I, every time when we go to the Holy Land, I always love stopping the scene when we come upon those. And we point them out to the people on the bus. A sycamore fig. This is the type of tree that Zacchaeus climbed up. Right. And you and I, I remember, picked off the, the, uh, the figs off that sycamore in Jericho for the people there. It's, a, it's the, the largest of the fig trees. And it's because it's so large, its wood is useful for lumber, but it's like 
American white pine. It's cheap wood. So they would use it for lumber, for building things inexpensively. If you wanted something nice, you'd use cedar from Lebanon. The fruit also, they would use the fruit, but the figs are these little tiny things. Not very good. It tastes like a fig, but it, it's a little woody. And so the people would eat these if they were poor or hungry. And so he shepherds his sheep. And when he has time, he climbs up a sycamore fig and picks off the little figs and feeds them uh, to his family or sells them to make a little money. So he's just showing his poverty here. You know, this is great as a background to the gospel. So we're going to jump in the gospel with all of that as a background. And <clears throat> the prophet Amos is an example, really, a, a um, say the, the uh, a prefigurement of the apostles. But to remember also the, the, the apostles are a prefigurement of our ministry in the church today. So with that, let's jump right in to the gospel text of Mark chapter 6, verse 7 through 13. Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And he instructed them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick, no food, no sack, no money in their belts. They were, however, to wear sandals but not a second tunic. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Whatever place does not welcome you or listen to you, leave there and shake the dust off your feet in testimony against them. So they went off and preached repentance. The 12 drove out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Father, give us the context here in, in, in Mark chapter six. So, there are two times when Jesus sends his disciples out as apostles. That is one who has been sent. We, we all know very well the end of the gospel, of course, which is why we're all here today, that the apostles were sent out by Jesus after his resurrection. That's mentioned at the end of Mark's gospel. It's mentioned at the end of, of Matthew's gospel, especially Matthew's gospel. We know well, he says, he says, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I've taught you. Behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. So Jesus has directed his apostles, his disciples, to be apostles, ones who are sent out. But what we sometimes are not aware of is that he had already done this once before. He gave them a little bit of a, uh, a, an experience that would help them with that second time he sent them, before he goes to Jerusalem, before his crucifixion, about midway through his ministry, after his disciples have got enough of his teaching under their belt, they've learned a bit from him, they've watched him, and how he, what he does and how he does things, and he sends them out for a bit. We don't know how long it was, maybe it was a few days, a couple weeks or so, and then they come back to him. And so this is that first sending out, I like to call it, their deacon year. You know, sometimes in the summer, we see in our parishes, the deacon uh, shows up from the seminary, or you get a seminarian that comes from this uh, seminary, and he spends the summer at the local parish. And the purpose of that is to give him some experience, so that when he actually gets ordained, and he comes, and he's assigned to a parish, he's been able to, uh, he, he can build on what he had already experienced before. And so, he Jesus as a good teacher, sends his disciples out on a kind of a little bit of a trial run. He sends them out for a little bit, and then they come back and report to him how things went. Then he continues to teach them, and then eventually goes to Jerusalem. He dies, he rises from the dead, and then eventually sends them out again. Why, why is it, Father, that he doesn't want them to take anything with him? They just, no, no food, no sack, no money, nothing. I mean, they go out there with nothing. Yeah, I think if I was going to go on a trip like this, I'd take a nice backpack, you know, <laughs> exactly. all the essentials, make sure you got your wallet. And he says, no, don't worry about that. Put the clothes on your back. That, that you're, that, that's all you're going to have. You're going to have a walking stick and a sandal and your sandals. So this is the essentials you're going to need to walk down the road. You're going to need to be clothed. You're going to need a walking stick, which is what they always do back then, and, and sandals. But what about money? What about you know, a second bag, some clothing, and things. He says, no, you don't need it. Don't even bring your wallet. Why is that? Because they're going to be needing to experience 
now, in a small way, what they're going to be needing to deal with later on, we know St. Paul's travels, right? Going from village to village, being thrown in prison, shipwrecked. They're going to need to move quickly and lightly, one. And two, they're going to need, most importantly, to rely every moment of that journey on the Lord who will provide for them as they have need. You know, it says that their primary ministry, the primary goal, he sends them out to do one thing. Um, he gave them authority over unclean spirits. And, um, and, uh, but then it says that they went off and they preached repentance. And uh, just, you know, uh, if you could just share with us your thoughts on this idea, this, this connection between um, their ministry of repentance, the ministry of driving out demons, and then this, uh, this healing of the sick, There's, there seems to be this continual confrontation that Christ has and the apostles have um, with the demons and with sick people, and they're constantly doing one thing, and that is to call on people to repentance. Help us understand, why is this the ministry which the church has been given? So, it, Mark's gospel is a great example here of why we need all the Gospels, and why we need the tradition, right? We don't just read the Bible, the Bible alone, as Luther suggested. But we, we read these texts within the tradition. And part of that is the greater context that you've emphasized so many times for the audience is, you know, you don't just read a passage out of Mark and then run off with it. You read the passage in Mark in its literary context of Gospel of Mark, in the historical context of the, of the author Mark and his audience, but we also read in the context of the, of the four Gospels, the, the epistles and everything, and the teachings of the church. And so when we go back to the parallel text, text here in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew tells them to go out and heal the sick, cast out demons, uh, preach the gospel, and things like that. So he, he tells them these things. Mark is assuming here that we know, we know all of that. You know, the, the, they, they're given also this almost like a potion. I think I think back to like the Hobbit or like all these old stories, you know, of like guys going out and they anointed with oil, almost like they have this kind of uh, the, the, the magic oil, if you will, they anointed with oil, many who were sick and cured them. First of all, this is before Pentecost. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering what's going on. Is this the, is this the anointing of the sick that we know in the church why are they using oil? Why don't they just, why don't they just heal these guys? Um, I mean, it, you know, Jesus seems to do the same thing with water uh, and other things where he's using the material world, somehow bringing about healing, salvation, restoration to people. Um, what, would, what would, you know, I don't know, some guy walking up to me out of the blue and starts putting oil on me, it kind of seems a little bit weird, but it, I think you've got some insights for us why it made sense in that culture. Uh, yeah, the, you know, <clears throat> I would say a friend of mine, a Protestant friend who said to me one thing I've, uh, about this issue that I've, I've never forgotten. He said to me, you know, Sebastian, the Old Testament, and it's here in the New too, but this was, for him, there's also the Old Testament. The Old Testament, it's so sacramental. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, God's always getting dirty, right? I mean, why does he got to use oil to put, he puts oil on the priests and he has oil used on the, on the, the king to make them anointed. He uses water for this and ashes for that and mud. And, and of course, as you just said, we see Jesus doing the exact same thing in the New Testament. He spits on the ground and makes mud and smears on a guy's eyes, right? Or he breathes on them. Why these things? Why is he doing this? And I know you've got some answers, but before uh, we get to that fulfillment, I'll answer the question you asked is in the context here, why oil in this particular story? Oil was for them something more than what you put on your salad. For us, oil, if I say olive oil, which is what they had back then, olive oil uh, in that region, we think, uh, do you mean extra virgin or light? Oh, what am I going to put on my vegetables or my salad? Or what am I going to do with it? But for them, oil was a, a staple. It was something they used all day long in almost every aspect of their life. If they had dry skin, they put they didn't have lotion from the you know from the pharmacy. They put olive oil on themselves. If they if they had a cut, they would put oil on it. 
because the oil would create a little, they didn't understand this, what it, why it worked, but they knew that it would keep, it would keep that cut from getting infected. We now know that it creates a, a barrier for microbes being able to get in there, like Neosporin. Right? We have Neosporin with the antibiotics, but it's in Vaseline, right? It's an oil, which creates that mechanical barrier from the microbes to be able to get in there. We can think of the, uh, the Good Samaritan doing this with oil and wine in the wounds. So they used oil to heal. They saw it as a source of healing. Also, when you would, if you put oil on dry skin, any of us who put lotion on our dry skin, we suddenly feel a little bit more flexible. And so they saw the oil as a source of energy, of life, of rejuvenation. And so they would use oil when someone got sick, not only would they put it on a cut, but if someone's head hurt, well, let's put the oil on the head. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a medical standpoint, but, uh, but they, this is what they did. They did the best they could at the time. You know, I was just thinking I was uh, making a sick call yesterday and uh, wasn't able to visit the person who was, who was sick um, because she was in with the, with the doctor. But I left a little vial of oil with her, with her husband um, so that he could bless her with the sign of the cross um, when, she was, when she could be seen. And um, it's, it's, it's important these, we hear these things that we allow ourselves to stand in the context of the gospel and realize that our ministry is, is, the, is an apostolic ministry. And uh, the anointing of the sick is something which is not, um, say, the kind of, you know, oh, we're in trouble, call the priest, he can fix it, you know. This is an apostolic ministry which has been handed on from Christ himself. It is the work of God who takes the things of nature, as you said, the oil and water and all, and does with them what they were meant to do in the beginning, and that is to communicate God's life. All of creation was meant to be divinized and to be a, a place where we could encounter the Lord himself, um, which is why we're made to eat and live forever, why we're baptized through water to receive life. Water sustains us in our life as we drink it, but that's not its purpose. I mean, that is its purpose, but that's, that's, a, that's kind of the, the ultimate purpose of water is baptism. That's why God made water, so that people could be brought to the fullness of life, that his life could be communicated through the things of this world. Um, and uh, it seems as though, almost, Father, we get, a, we get what we might call an anointing of the sick here, um, and, uh, and I think other, if I'm not mistaken, it comes up also later in the epistles, um, this ministry of the church of anointing the sick, of anointing people who are ill for their healing, both body and soul. Am, am I right about that? So this is a great example that you bring up here is of what we were talking about earlier. There's these two stages of the teaching of these apostles. Jesus Jesus came to found the church. And so one of the most important things he's doing with these individuals, this is like apostolic boot camp. He's training them so that when he sends them out the second time, when he ascends to the father, they're well prepared for what they have to do. So he even directs them here. And this is something that they would have understood from their culture, that when they went out and they found someone who was sick, when they were out in this deacon year, uh, going to the villages for this short time, that they would use oil and they would anoint the sick and pray over them, of course, and they would, they would be healed. This is a prefigurement then of what they are going to do after the resurrection and after Pentecost and all of that, as you said, we're going to see them doing this again, just like we see them doing other things in preparation. And we're going to see them doing this again now. And what is clearly at that point, this, the sacrament of anointing, and that's in James chapter 5. And I think it might be helpful if we just turn there for a second. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, James chapter 5. We just looked James. at this and did a study at the at the um, at a webinar study. So if anybody wants to look up um, the Epistle of Straw, uh, we did this with Dr. Stephen Smith. So you can look it up in our library now. But um, yeah, James, you said chapter 5, Father? Chapter 5, verse 13. This is James chapter 5, verse 13. He says, Is any one among you suffering? Now, this is the early church. So this is after the ascension. Now, just to make sure we have our context. Jesus is ascended to the Father. The apostles are being sent out. And they're writing, you know, this is during the time of Paul. Paul's writing epistles and things like that. So we're in the apostolic era then. <clears throat> he says, Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? 
Let him call for the elders of the church, which in the context here, historically, this would be the bishops. Call for the bishops or the apostles. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, right? In, in the name of the Lord. That is, they stand there and anoint him as if it was the Lord doing it, right? They're standing mm-hmm. in the Lord's name and doing it. And, and the prayer of the faith, so they're not just going to put oil on him and say, oh, I hope this works, right? The prayer of the faith, there's a prayer that goes with this, praying for the healing. Prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And so, as you mentioned, we have, in the, in the ministry of the church, we have the use of this holy oil, this anointing oil. I actually happen to have some. I always keep it handy. I have some sitting right here on my desk. Uh, so, and I keep that in my pocket when I leave the house and when I'm go to visit someone, which I'm going to do today after we're done with our reflection, I have a sick call and I will go in and anoint the individual and lay my hands on them and pray that the Lord will alleviate their suffering and return them to good health. But as you said, and as I always do with them as well, I always leave them a little oil so that they also can pray, even in the priest's absence, they can anoint each other. It's not the sacrament of anointing, but they can anoint each other and pray for each other until the priest comes again. You know, uh, I'm going to move away from anointing for just a moment and back to this idea of preaching. Um, And we have the prophet Amos. We now have the 12 apostles. um, And and then you mentioned this boot camp. And uh, that, you know, it's, it's not always easy um, in fact, it says that whatever place does not welcome you, it doesn't say if a place doesn't welcome you. It says whatever place doesn't welcome you. It means there's going to be places that don't welcome you. Um, and, um, and they won't listen to you, just like Amos was rejected going to the north. Um, and then dust off your feet. And, you know, um, it, it's important. it's important that we uh, kind of go through that boot camp in the church. Uh, some people may say, you told the husband to bless his wife? I thought that was only for the priest. Well, it certainly is for the priest to do. And I don't mean to be replacing the ministry of the, of, of the priest. And you certainly should, as James says, call the elders. Call the elders. I just found out yesterday after I finished the liturgy that one of my parishioners was intensive care unit. I had been out of town for four days. And the family knew I was out of town. I was in Houston, Texas. And, um, but I got back into town went straight to church to celebrate the liturgy. And afterwards I found out this man was in intensive care. I said, why didn't anybody call me? And they said, well, you were out of town. I said, whoa, I was out of town. You started to call me and say, I pray for you. So I'm not, I'm, you've got to remember to always be in contact with, with your, the ministers of your church, um, but also not to be afraid of being a minister of Christ, especially within the context of your family. So many people, and this is where I want to go back to the preaching thing for a minute. So many people say, well, I, gee whiz, I can't go out there and proclaim, you know, the gospel message in the marketplace, and I can't go and do this. I don't know what to say when I do it. I say, well, wait a minute. Did you ever go through boot camp? Have you done boot camp in your homes? Have you spoken with each other about the faith? Have you preached the gospel to your spouse? Have you preached the gospel, the good words of Jesus Christ, the good news of Christ and the resurrection to your children or to your siblings? Not always an easy place, let me tell you, to do it. In fact, oftentimes that's the place where we end up being rejected. Uh, But nevertheless, if we're going to prepare for our ministry in our workplace and out in the marketplace and out, uh, let's get ready by making sure that our homes are as they should be, which is a domestic church where there, the, the anointing of Christ is taking place, or the prayer of Christ is taking place, or the preaching of the gospel is taking place. And having gone through that place of preparation, then we're going to be prepared for our ministry to go, if you sent, in a sense, to go north to, to uh, the kingdom, which is in schism and gone and, and broken, broken free. So uh, let's take a look here at, at, the, at the second reading, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14. I shouldn't have said broken free there, put themselves in bondage apart from the communion of, of, of Jesus Christ. Reading uh, the second reading, uh, Ephesians chapter one, chapter one, verse three and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blemish before him. In love he destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ, in accord with the favor of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace that he granted us in the beloved. In him we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, in accord with the riches of his grace and the that he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor, that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of time, to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. In him we were also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the intention of his will, so that we might exist for the praise of his glory. We who first hoped in Christ, in him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance toward redemption of God's possession, to the praise of his glory. A very beautiful text which is given to us here uh, in the epistle to the Ephesians. Uh, he, uh, there's other places, Ephesians chapter 5, and somebody talks about this almost bridal aspect of, of the church in this relationship with God, um, being uh, like a spotless bride, unblemished, and so forth. Um, certainly, certainly here in Ephesians, Father, uh, St. Paul is, is really stressing this importance of, of incorporation, uh, of adoption, of the two becoming one flesh. Um, but there's maybe some d difficult uh, phrases here. They're diff a little difficult to understand. Like the, in him, we have redemption by his blood, um, the, sealed by the promise of the first installment of our inheritance. We need to slow down a bit in reading this text. It's very rich, very rich. Lots of uh, beautiful insights um, that we need to take a look at. But first, give us, as I always ask, give us that context of the letter of the Ephesians, this text within the context of the letter, but also what St. Paul talking about to the Ephesians themselves. Yeah, so this is Paul's, one of Paul's captivity letters. He wrote his captivity letters, these particular ones here, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, during his first captivity. There were two captives of Paul. The second one is the time when he was martyred. But the first one is the one we read about at the end of Acts the Apostles. And during that imprisonment in Caesarea Philippi, down on, or, um, Caesarea Philippi, uh, on, the, on the coast there, Caesarea Maritime, Maritime, and then also in his imprisonment in Rome, while, during that time he wrote some epistles. This is one of them, his letter to the Ephesians. The church of Ephesus knew Paul well. He had spent a lot of time there, as we read in Acts the Apostles, in his second and third journeys. So what is it now St. Paul turns to this kind of sacrificial language about redemption by his blood, uh, the forgiveness of transgressions and so forth like that. I think this is, I know it's something that's maybe near and dear to your heart to make sure this is understood properly. Um, the ideas of redemption, justification, salvation, I think in our minds today are very much uh, muddled with all sorts of Protestant ideas and how to really speak in apostolic terms about what Jesus has done for us in giving his life in the crucifixion, in redemption, in justification. So help us understand this phrase, in him we have redemption by his blood. So right off the bat, the, the first thing to ask ourselves when we're talking about salvation, redemption, if we're not using sacramental language, then we're not speaking with the apostolic voice. Today, as you said, so many times, even you'll hear Catholics doing it, <clears throat> talking about salvation with no mention of the sacraments. The sacraments are for modern Catholics often when they talk about salvation because they're using Protestant language and, and a Protestant way of thinking, which is anti-sacramental. The sacraments are tangential. Uh, they're uh, something that on the side, some side benefit as opposed to central to salvation, which is how the faith was always understood before the Reformation. So whenever we talk about salvation as Catholics, we need to make sure 
that the main theme of our of what we're saying is baptism and confirmation and Eucharist. And then we're on the right track. As the early church preached salvation, we should be today. Sacramental theology is the authentic uh, theology of the church. So when we're looking here at this redemption by his blood, I, when I hear that, I, I can't get out of my mind the image I often see of that T-shirt. You see Protestants wearing a T-shirt with one of Jesus' hands with a big nail in it. And it says, his pain, my gain. <laughs> okay. Right. And we've talked about this issue before in other discussions. The ICC, you've addressed this so many times very well for, for the audience. But, but again, what do we talk? How do the sacraments connect here? Jesus died. Why did he die? Because the Jews killed him. As St. As Saint Stephen says, just before they killed St. Stephen, they murdered Jesus. They murdered the Messiah. He says this in Acts chapter 7. And, and, but that wasn't the end of the story. But God raised him from the dead. So the people at the time killed Jesus. But God raised him. From, God allowed that to happen. Jesus will allowed his will was to allow them to do that to him. But God's will was for Jesus to live. And so he allowed for the people to kill him, but God brought a greater good out of that evil. And that is Jesus rose from the dead and we can participate in his resurrection. We can have eternal life. We can share in that resurrection life. We can be restored to what we were supposed to have in the Garden of Eden through Jesus Christ. And how do we get in relationship with him? As you mentioned, you were talking about the relationship that Paul talks about in this epistle. Again, context, context. If we read the epistle of Ephesians or a little snippet, and that's all we're reading, we're not going to really understand what Paul's saying in a passage like this, because Paul's writing a letter to a community that he has formed and catechized. And so he uses language, just like we might in an email or a text to a friend, that has all sorts of meaning beyond just a few words. So we got to go out and look at all the Pauline epistles to understand when Paul talks about redemption by his blood, we should be thinking of things like what he said to the letter, in the letter to the Romans, a community that was not catechized by him. So he has all the explanations there. He says, you who have been baptized into Christ, this is Romans chapter 6, have died with him, have been buried with him, and raised with him the newness of life. He says in other places as well, I have been crucified with Christ. Well, when was Paul crucified with Christ? As we read all of his epistles together, Paul understands his own death, his own crucifixion, having been had at the moment of his baptism in Damascus. He has already died and been raised from the dead with Christ. The bodily resurrection will come as a result, as we're going to see. And so, Saved by his blood or being redeemed by his blood is a reference to the death of Christ, which gives us life. How do we participate in Christ's death and resurrection? Through the sacraments, through baptism. You know, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought this up because this is how the whole of this text that were placed before us concludes. Mm -hmm. um, it says, in fact, in, in some sense, in this little couple, maybe one sentence here, gives us the whole process of salvation in him. You also who have heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, the good news, the announcement of your salvation and having heard it, have believed in him. You therefore were sealed with the promised Holy spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance. So there's this process by which we, we hear we adhere, we, we believe, we accept that word. And once that word comes to place in us, then we do something. Huh? Uh, and, and, that, and that doing something, that, that sealing, we are sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's so important here to St. Paul uh, about this promised Holy Spirit, which is sealed. And this idea of the first installment of our inheritance. Father, please explain to us a little bit about what St. Paul in the broader context is talking about here, because it might seem a little bit strange. What is the first installment? I mean, are we taking a loan out from the bank? <laughs> well, 
Uh, I would turn our audience also, because this is we have so little time today to do this, but we did have a nice ICC uh, lecture series called Blood and Water, where we talked about these things. And the and we have to go back to the early church and look at their understanding of salvation, their understanding of sacraments, and how they celebrated them. It's often a shock for us that confirmation was not something you did as a bar mitzvah at age 15. In the early church, confirmation was always done following baptism, and ideally if the bishop was there, even in infancy. And so we see this in Acts of the Apostles, we see it in other places, Paul talking about baptism and then a laying on of hands with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he's, he's talking about entrance into the body of Christ. We are baptized into Christ, but for them, baptism and confirmation were two stages of one ceremony, one one church experience. They would baptize them. They would come out of the water and they'd lay their hands on them as the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as St. Cyprian calls it, as quoted in the catechism, it was the double sacrament, two things, two different stages, but really one event. You were now, you would now become a member of the body of Christ, now able to partic participate in his, in the Eucharist, in the body and blood of Christ a sign of who you now are. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are part of his flesh. You are raised from the dead spiritually. And as he promised in John chapter six, he eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have life in him. And I will raise him up on the last day, which is what he's saying here, right? That which is the second first installment. installment, but <laughs> so, you know, okay, let's wrap all of this together guys, because this now brings us full circle. We have been invited into we have been given the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have we've become partakers of the divine nature. We have been adopted as sons. Um, in, so ma in so many ways, this epistle just sums up all of this business. Um, and I look back to the prophet Amos and, um, and, and say, and, and also to the gospel of Mark. And, and Jesus summoned the 12 and began to send them out two by two. And I can only imagine what they must have been saying, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a dresser of sycamores. You know, I'm a fisherman. Um, you know, I'm a construction worker. I'm a shepherd of the field. What do you want me to do? You want me to go out and you want me to proclaim the good news to the world? Do you want me to heal and drive out demons? Yes. That is your ministry as a Christian. To be Christ. And nothing less. I so oftentimes hear people say, well, you know, that's for Jesus. That's for the priests to do. That's for, that's for somebody else. You have been incorporated into Christ. You've been incorporated into Christ for his ministry of salvation, to bring salvation to others. And I ask you, are you bringing salvation to others? Are you? I leave you with that question today. Going into this Sunday, um, in, this, in, this, in this time of, of this post-Pentecost season in which the church is now going out. In fact, in our Byzantine tradition, the Byzantine lectionary, this Sunday is the celebration of the first six ecumenical councils because that's the, the time of the early church. We go out and proclaim uh, the, the truth of Jesus Christ regardless of the consequences. What does it say here in the gospel? If they, if they reject you, then move on to another house. So let us prepare now in prayer that we will be healed with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that we will be made one with Christ, incorporated into him, that we might live out our vocation as sons and daughters of God, restored in the image and likeness of Christ himself. To him be glory both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.